Good. We're here at Life Radio today. We're talking with Stefan Stefan Grenier. Is that how you pronounce it? Grenier, yeah. It's Grenier. Grenier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, with his new book. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your book there. Yeah. So I, uh, I was kind of bullied into writing the book uh, okay. by a psychiatrist and a psychologist in uh, in the Hamilton area who said, "Stefan, you need to write a book and bullied in a good way, right?" And I wrote this book to. Uh, Get, get Canadians to reflect on how they can play an active role and how we can all play an active role in transforming the mental health system in Canada where we really need to stop depending on just the clinical system to, to help yes. people, which is fine. I mean, I'm for clinical care. But what about everyday Canadians and what they can do to support other Canadians who are going through hardship, either at the community level, at the hospital health care level, or even in the workplace? So our big focus is the workplace right now. For sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, it was a great speech. I was listening to all Thank the things, thinking about the different uh, things that happen to people mentally. Because we've been going through a lot of this. We actually have a doctor come on. We're starting a new show about mental health. Because I think it's one of the the mainstays in our community that yep. we need to fix yep. and build a support system, like yep. you're talking about. Which hopefully we can do that. But one thing I noticed is uh, not in this particular speech about addictions. Not so much drug addictions, there's people with all kinds of addictions, yep. whether it's uh, alcohol addiction, drug addictions, playing gambling machines too much or whatever. And then they uh, they seem to get compounded in the mental stress at work. So is there stuff that people can do towards helping get people out of those things in a better light? Well, so what we don't do in, in, in both of our companies is get into those clinical pathways, right? Okay. And so how to, how to actually treat conditions is not something we do. What we do is we implement programs to complement the treating cycle, okay. either for a any kind of mental health problem, right? And, uh, and, and so what you did not hear from me today is a lot of clinical talk. So right. if somebody's depressed, you do this. If somebody has bipolar, schizophrenia, um, substance abuse problems, gambling issues, addictions, right? You didn't hear me say that. Right. Because to us, um, we're, we're about creating support systems that support people through that recovery journey. Okay. By who? By people who have already recovered from it. So one thing that is common to compare to is Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. Right? A lot of people say, oh, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, it is and it isn't, but it's a good comparison in the sense that that whole movement is really empowering people to get together understand they're not the only ones going through the, the issues they've been going through and support each other at, at remaining abstinent in, in that particular addiction recovery formula because there's, you know, there, there's different formulas and different sure. beliefs. So we're not there to, to treat or, or, or add a treatment intervention, but we're there to create the systems so that between medical appointments that there are people that the person recovering can relate to, and that's called peer support. Okay. It's, it's, it's to receive the support of like-minded people who have recovered from this issue uh, before you, <laughs> a few yeah. years ago, who have learned a great deal and who can be supportive in your recovery. And that makes a whole lot of difference. Why? Because it allows the person going through the toughest time in their lives to realize they're not the only one. And when you realize you're not the only one, hope starts galvanizing. And with hope, recovery is possible. Right? Sure. So. Just trying to get a, a whole grasp on the thing. So are you going into workplaces or are we talking to the, like how are we getting this into the workplace? Yeah, the, so, the so, yeah so, uh, so we have multiple clients who are corporate clients. Like today we were talking here with the New Brunswick Community College yes. uh, in, in Miramichi. Uh, and so workplaces come to us, we create their program, we launch their program, and at the end of the day, what the program looks like is we recruit from the workplace itself people who right. are already on that payroll. Okay. We recruit them because they say, yeah, I've had a mental health challenge in my past. I've had addiction issues in my past. I'm, I'm recovered. I'm solid now. I want to support others. We check that they have the competencies because not everybody should be doing this or could do this. Uh, and we train them and we make them understand what the limits of their support is to make sure that they don't breach boundaries and then we we sort of connect them to other people who are going through problems now in that very workplace right and so an employee of any organization that has the program can of course call the employee assistance program they can go to the local clinic they can go to their general practitioner doctor family doctor it's all good but if they if they're wondering and they're 
they can tap into that peer support, understand a little more what's going on with themselves. And even if when they are getting clinical care, between medical appointments, what we find with peer support is without those little conversations every once in a while, it's very easy for the mind to slip back. Sure. Right? And sometimes these medical appointments with clinicians can be three weeks apart. So if you have nobody to relate to, right? Right. Um, very difficult. And so companies are launching these, these programs. Uh, and we manage them and we launch them on their behalf. I'm noticing that uh, just in myself, just since I started working with Life Radio and trying to get in the community and <clears throat> find out about people like yourself and what we're doing, that when I go to these things, I get inspired. Because all of us have problems in our life. We've had problems, gone through things, whatever. And I feel them, I and mean, my life is changing, getting better all the time just by being out there learning about. So it's too bad there wasn't a way that the people who need this, the people that are in work groups, maybe the work could be sending them to things like this where we could have seminars. They say, oh, go to this mental health seminar and hear about a guy who went through some troubles. I mean, it's great that we're here and we're, all the leaders are here. Like at a meeting like this, we had the leaders here doing the whole, mm -hmm. but the people that, that need to hear that stuff, yeah, we need to get them to things like this. So there should be a way yeah. to support, make a some kind of support group. I don't know how we're going to do it yet, but that's an idea. That yeah, it, it, I, I, I get what you're saying, and I also would add that an event like this today is important, right? It's an event. Mm -hmm. But this is not the solution either, right? Because an event is an event is an event. Yeah. Because after the event, six months after the event, the, those people who need help need a support program, right? They need to be able to, to talk to somebody, and, and what the programs we implement actually will put a peer supporter and a peer, that the peer is the person going through right. a rough time, uh, literally in a Tim Hortons coffee shop. Oh, really? Over coffee, right? Okay. And, and having a conversation about, no, it's not a pity party. Right. It's a supportive conversation. To say, at the end of it, to say, buddy, it's going to be okay, all right? These Let's are some of the things I went through. Exactly. You're not alone. Uh, and, and of course, the peer support is not there to tell their story right. and bore the person. But at the end of the day, when we leave, you're going to realize, shit, I'm not the only one going through this. If Steph got out of it, maybe I can too. And I'm going to, yeah, let's go for coffee again next week, Steph, because I, I want to continue the conversation, right? So it sounds really simple, and it is. But what we do is we create that accountability framework and we create safety around right. this, right? Because of course, ask any mental health professional, so do you think it's a good idea to have uh, two people with mental health problems talking to each other? They'll probably say, well, yes, but, but, but. There's a bunch of caveats, right? Yeah. So we address all those caveats. We've all been doing right. this for 20 years, right? Okay. To make sure that when you're receiving support, let's say from a guy like me, I'm not saying things that are gonna make things worse. Now, if I'm, if you have a broken leg and you're wondering how long is this thing gonna be painful or whatever, my support with you, whatever I say, is not going to make that leg worse. No. However, what I say to you mentally could make your mental health condition worse. Yeah. Right? The Therefore, that's why it's so critical that we allow people to talk, but we do it in a safe way. Right. So I don't want to overcomplicate this. We're not rocket scientists. Sure. But there's a few things you need to get right. So when organizations launch these programs, it's important for them to do it right. If you do it wrong, you're going to do harm, and we know clinicians don't want to do harm, right? So all that said, it's, that's what we do, right? Because an event is an event. Sure. In six months from now, this event will be long forgotten, right? Yeah. But people, wouldn't it be cool if people can meet in a coffee shop, have a 15-minute conversation over coffee, right? That would be great. An empowering, re-socializing conversation. Because what happens with mental health problems is people isolate. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't go to parties anymore. They don't go to the lunchroom. So in workplace context, what happens now today and, and with all of our clients is that after the work shift is over, you got peer supporters bumping into deliberately with peers in the coffee shop on their way home for 25 minutes, half an hour. And those conversations are creating results. Long-term disability is going down. Short-term disability is going down. People are staying at work instead of going on sick leave. They're calling EAP sooner as opposed to waiting nine months, they're, they're calling a month okay. in, right? So all of this is So positive. you can actually measure and see Absolutely, we've been, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So how, I, I can see how this works in a, a large corporation or a you know, yeah. big, so how do, how's a way to translate it into smaller groups? Like even just say one example, like say a car company. Yeah. It's got whatever, 30 employees. Like a dealership? Yeah, a dealership, yeah. car dealership. It's got a few guys in the back, you know, the lower paid guys, and you got the car dealer guy. Each one has their own set of problems. Yeah. But how can, a, somebody like that 
through your internet programs maybe or is there ways so, that they can so yeah our service is a subscription based service now right right uh, where you pay for the amount of people you have a bit like an employee assistance program or a group benefit plan okay you know companies will pay so if you look at any dealership here in Miramichi, right. they're, they're, they're going to have a benefit plan or an EAP program for those sure. 30 employees. So these companies are already in the habit of paying a couple of dollars or five dollars an employee per month right. you know, to, to look after those benefits. So we have the same formula. So, essentially so you're paying per capita right and they could save on the other end because people are healthy and well that's it. better exactly so what, what's happening however yeah what's happening with mental health is people don't see the results right away their economies i compare it to you know people who buy an air conditioner mm -hmm. for their house they've been hot you know for 20 years they go oh, damn it we're buying an air conditioning unit well that unit's going to be five thousand bucks let's say right so if you think you're going to be cool first summer for five thousand dollars worth you're kidding yourself you're going to be happy you're going to make your money and feeling good and not overwhelmingly hot over multiple years right mm -hmm. so that return on investment on that air conditioner is not going to be felt on the first heat wave right it's going to take years mental health is a bit of a long burn as well so when you implement any kind of a program the the effect is not instantaneous it takes six months to a year to build up, right? And that's been the statistical sort of curve for all of our clients. Okay. What we're also doing for small organizations uh, is trying to see if there's not a larger umbrella they fit under. Okay. Like uh, trucking companies, yeah. as an example. Trucking companies in, in New Brunswick, your average uh, employee size might be 20, 25, 30 employees, let's say, right? However, there might be a, truck, a tr trucker's association some sort, right? Okay. So under the association now, if you can galvanize, you know, every trucking company mm -hmm. in the, at the provincial level, at the association level, now instead of costing, let's say, seventeen dollars per employee per year, it's costing, depending on the size, maybe forty cents an employee, because you've you've mustered the collective buying power, right? So that's a formula that that is starting to to grow legs okay. right now I, for small organizations, right? I'm thinking. We have a lot of meetings with different charities and groups that we get together with every couple of weeks to see what we're doing in the community to make a difference. And they're always the same thing. They're always looking for grants and the government gives grants and stuff. But you would think there'd be something government-wise because yeah. of the money they'd save just in the health care if you yeah. get people healthy mentally. Yes. So is there, do you guys work on that too? or is it Well, we don't work separate? on grants. Yeah, so we're at the service provider level, but for sure we do, we do know that those grants exist. We will try to connect our clients to those grants. Okay. But it's it's you know we're we're on the receiving end of a part of that grant, right? A part right. of that grant will go pay some research or something like that, and we're at the implementation end. But okay. for sure, uh, you know, workers' compensation are starting to pay attention to this because benefit costs are rising, skyrocketing. So employers are paying more and more in benefit costs every year. I know I run a second company yeah. where I have employees and my benefits are, you know, it's not cheap, right? No. And so companies are taking note on the benefit side of things. Um, and so at the provincial level, the workers' compensation boards are starting to pay attention to, and I'm now invited by two provinces, actually. Uh, you know, I went to Western Canada recently and I'm doing another one more central. Uh, where the workers' compensation boards at the provincial level are saying, okay, we, uh, we need to understand what you guys do because this could create systemic change, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. So, um, That's what we're looking at. I think yeah. I love the idea of it, yeah. just, just trying to make sure I can grasp yeah, how I know. you guys are going about it, which it's, it's hard to do. It's and very it's, simple. If you go to supportyourpeople.com, yeah. very easy to remember, supportyourpeople.com, you can see you know, what, what the service is. And, and how it trickles and get an out. understanding of how, yeah, how it can help your employees. Okay, so that's, yeah. and we get, well, we got that on there. I want to make sure we get yeah, that. Yeah, it's on my business card too. Yeah. All right, and on a personal note, so how did, what gave you obviously are passionate about this and you're just into it. What got you started just because feeling uh, so down after the war and the PTSD and- Almost dying and because of, of uh, how I was feeling and realizing something is not going well and then realizing that my workplace was part of the problem and saying instead of becoming angry I'm going to try to make change from inside and I was lucky enough and I talk about it in the book lucky enough to meet a wonderful general and they're not all wonderful but this one was a true leader there are good leaders out sure. there 
happened to be empowered by a, an outstanding leader, General Couture, who, who believed that there was a better way. Uh, and uh, that's how I got started. I would have not met that man, not given the mandate I was given. I mean, I created my own job out of passion, perhaps, but the passion turned into mm -hmm. program, implementation, and discipline, and accountability, right? Um, and that's what we're good at, right? We're good at, at working with clients, you know, so it's not a military thing, but when you implement a program like this in the military, the military is pretty strict about things, right? As, as we all know. So for us now, working with private enterprise and governments, actually, it's pretty easy for us to, to do a good job because they demand rigor and we bring rigor, right? Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure coming to note and listen to your seminar. Right on. And, uh, Thanks for caring. The book, After the War, we're going to put a link to on our page. So when we're, we'll put our, obviously it'll be on the radio every day, but when we put our uh, Facebook page up and our Instagram and stuff, we'll put a link there. Oh, thank you. So people will be able to go in and be able to get your book and it's empowering. And Chapters I, one and two are a little tough. Yeah. I've been recommended uh, by a psychologist that some people who might be, you know, light at heart to start a chapter three. Okay. Uh, and then if they, uh, if they want to go back during the war time in Rwanda, they can go back and read chapter one and two. And uh, it's, a, it's just a kind, kind sort of warning. I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a book about puppies and kittens, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it has a happy ending so for you. So you have readers. many books or? I, 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 is this your first one? Or is my first book about, you know, my, my book, but okay. I, did, I did write that, you know, things, chapters that appeared in books before. Okay. But this is this my is only book. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much well, for caring. I, well, we're right. trying to make a difference, and I see you are too. So Absolutely. Everything, that's great. Well, thank that's you, sir. it for Life Radio, and we thank you for coming out. You're welcome. It was awesome.